I am from EOK and you're in the stream. Today, a look at three stories making headlines in Asia. Now, remember, you can be part of our conversation today. YouTube chat is open. Let me know your thoughts and I'll do my best to feature them in the show. But get in there fast. We're doing a lot today. Coming up, a new law in Singapore is raising concerns about a crackdown on dissent. And could the Korean Peninsula be closer to peace than ever before? We start this episode in Myanmar. Nine months after the coup, is Myanmar becoming a failed state? After 265 days, the coup attempt in Myanmar remains a failure because of the strong resistance inside the country and continuous solidarity from peoples around the world and pressure from the international community. The recent announcement of the mass amnesty was one of the direct results of the continuous solidarity and pressure from the international community. But it was never enough because the junta has announced they are releasing more than 5,000 people, but on the ground over four days, they have released only half of what they have announced, thousands and thousands uh, remain in prison, including the key politicians and protest and strike leaders. So um, we want democracy back, we want freedom back, and we have, this is a revolution in progress. Uh, we want everyone who are not supposed to be arrested in the very beginning to be released immediately and unconditional. We are joined by Wei Nin, a human rights activist and senior advocacy officer at Burma Campaign UK. Wei Nin, welcome back to the stream. The, the initial question that we asked is, is Myanmar becoming a failed state nine months after a coup? Um, thank you for having me again on the show. I would say uh, since February, uh, a lot of people's life have been changed. Uh, atrocities happening every day, people being arrested, people being killed. The military continue to uh, commit atrocities with such impunity. Uh, whether Burma is becoming a failed state or not, international community has a huge responsibility because Burma has a legitimate government that the people voted for and the military staged the coup because they didn't like the result and they want to control the power. And uh, in ethnic areas, there are so many ethnic armed organizations, which is very organized, which is very strategic. So. Uh, we have all these things in place and the military is the one that no one wants the military to be in power. No one wants the military dictatorship in the country and people are risking their lives every day. Until now, there are protests happening, despite the fact that military arrest anyone they see. But the really sad thing is that we haven't seen any support or at least an effective action coming from the international community to support mm -hmm. these movements. And people, you know, are holding signs in English because they really want the international community to help. And we know that there are so many things that people, you know, international community can do, and but they have failed us for so long. And they have failed us when the genocide of the Rohingya happened in 2017. They have failed us since February. So, um, you know, we know they can do things. So it is our duty to keep pushing for them to take effective action against the military and hold them accountable. When you say that there hasn't been international pressure, but I am looking at a remarkable shot on my laptop. This is the ASEAN meeting. There are heads of state from all over Asia here. And I'm just seeing this box here, Myanmar. Nobody is here because they haven't been invited. They've been excluded. I have to say, this is a, an organization, a group that tries not to to, to actually speak out about what is happening in your own country, that is your own business. Um, it tends to be quite agnostic about that. So to not be invited to ASEAN, isn't that international pressure, regional pressure? I would say um, ASEAN always has a policy of non-interference. Mm. Uh, they want to go down the engagement route uh, with, you know, with the military. But even ASEAN decided not, decided not to invite the military, and it's a really good... Uh, symbolic gesture and uh, because of that we have and because of other pressure we have seen the release of political prisoners so it's an example that the international pressure can work and it works and the military in Burma is not immune to it but the problem is that well let's talk about global arms embargo despite the fact that military is been breaking international law for decades there is no arms embargo on Burma and despite the fact that military committed genocide against the Rohingya and ethnic cleansing against the ethnic minorities in my country for decades, there is no uh, justice and accountability measure against the military. And uh, one of the main sanctions call we have been calling for is to 
uh, stop the revenue coming from the oil and gas sector because this is the biggest income for the Burmese military. They won't be using these money to build schools. They are using these money to buy more weapons. But none of these actions are being done at the moment. And we have been calling all these three action since February, and we haven't right. seen that. Yes, we've seen some, uh, you know, sanctions against the Burmese military companies and businesses, but it needs to be more. So I, I want to bring in uh, one more voice into our, our conversation, and that is a human rights active, a, activist. He's the executive director of Synergy Social Harmony Organization. He has a warning, warning slash appeal for the international community. Have a listen, Wayne In. I would like to request to the international community not to recognize the fascist military group. They are the fascist group to act, and the fascist group must Return the power they have stolen from the people. They must surrender to the people and they must take accountability for whatever they have done to the people. And we, the people, will never forget and will never forgive. Many mm. thoughts? You know, there are so many. Um, it was great to see police and political business last week. Uh, it was great to see families being reunited with each other. But we have to remember that it, they shouldn't have been in prison in the first place, let alone going through torture and trauma or being tortured and being in prison uh, with inhumane treatments. And there many people have been rearrested on the same day after being released. And all these released people, they won't be able to go back to their old life. They won't be able to uh, get their job. They won't be able to go back to their job or get new job because they have criminal records. So many lives being destroyed uh, because of one man, Mayan Line, the head of the Burmese military, who wants to control and take control of the power and take control of the wealth that, you know, uh, in the country. So is it such a devastating uh, situation in the country at the moment? Mm. Wayne, thank you so much for coming back to see us on the stream. I know we'll be asking you back another time, but for now, we appreciate your time. Thank we you. had to Singapore, where the passage of the Foreign Interference Countermeasures Bill, or FICA, has rights groups concerned. The law is alarming and dangerous. When the government speaks of preventing meddling in domestic affairs, it is actually trying to justify the silencing of dissenting voices. The law is not only harmful to those critical of the government, but it is also broad and vague enough to apply to any activity relating to politics, social justice, and other matters of public interest. The law will not only be used against independent media and civil society, but also could target academia and even foreign industry that falls afoul of the government. There is very limited oversight of this law and those contravening it are subject to severe penalties. FICA allows authorities to compel internet service providers and social media platforms to provide user information, block content, and remove apps the government deems hostile. The legislation will also target foreign funding of groups identified as being politically significant. The government says the aim of FICA is to protect its sovereignty. Joining us to share her thoughts on FICA, Kokila Anna Malay, a community organizer in Singapore. I keep thinking, Kokila, why? Why do you need this bill in Singapore? You know, it's, it's become very clear, both um, from the debate in Parliament and all the government rhetoric around it, that this law is really meant to crack down on local dissent in the name of uh, national sovereignty and preventing uh, malicious disinformation campaigns. Um, and, and, and one of the most um, dangerous things about this law is how it undermines transnational solidarity. So, you know, you were just talking about um, the Burmese military coup. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, th there are many Burmese uh, living in Singapore who would not be able to participate in the local solidarity campaign to speak up about the issues in their homeland because of a law like this, right? So it, it, there, are, there are more than 1.5 million non-residents living in Singapore. And this law really alienates um, their voices and their participation in local politics um, and uh, speaking up even on social issues. I want to share this with you. This is from Muad. He uh, tweeted us just a little bit earlier. He knew we were going to be talking about FICA. He says, a bit overboard, but maybe necessary. 
how do they balance national security with globalization and international relations? We all know too much of nationalization is not good for any country, world trade or global economy. Hmm. Your thoughts to Muad. Well, if you look at the, the, the law itself, there it's just extremely broad. You know, so it's it's the language is worded so broadly that any communication or collaboration with a non-Singaporean on matters of social or political interest could be criminalized or prohibited. Right? This could this law could mean that uh, anyone can be designated politically significant just be merely on the basis of of the Minister for Home Affairs and government authorities suspecting you without any evidence. And once you're designated politically significant, you have to provide any information they ask for. You have to comply with any directions to take down information. And you'll be subject to a whole range of restrictions and control that the government can place on you, which could really intimidate any kind of local support. So I think one of the things that's really important to recognize about FICA is that while it is being marketed by the state as a law that's going to prevent foreign intervention, malicious foreign intervention in local politics, what it will do is intimidate a lot of local supporters of critics uh, and dissenters and activists and independent media publications, because in such an authoritarian environment, a lot of people rely on their anonymity to support these efforts. And now they will no longer have the right to anonymity, because if I'm designated politically significant, the government can ask me for the records of anyone who has ever contributed to my efforts, supported me financially, or collaborated with me on any project. So all of these, uh, I'm going to say worst case scenarios, how this bill, if it, if it becomes law, could go wrong. The Minister of Home Affairs for Singapore says this is all a misunderstanding. Have a listen to the Minister Kokola and then respond right off the back of the video I'm about to show. Here it is. There has been some degree of misrepresentation on FICA that this bill seeks to curtail normal interactions with foreigners. Uh, that is not true. Singapore depends for its success and vitality on being open. And a government that seeks to close down that will lead Singapore to ruin. So the, the minister in the same parliamentary debate mentioned independent journalists and activists as examples of people who this law targets and who whose activities that he labels as malicious could could now be controlled under this law. So this is what's really troubling, right? Is that is that in um, in the same breath as saying that this this law is not going to target such ordinary collaboration and activity. It really very much um, has been proven by his, his very same comments okay. in, in Parliament that this is what will be targeted. I have some questions. I'm going to fire them at you really fast. This is rapid fire, OK, Kokela, so we can get in as many as possible. Andy says, I think Singapore is crossing the line of democracy and legitimacy and social justice by introducing such a law. So any dissent from locals will be stamped out under this law. Singapore has learnt their lesson. Quick response. Very quick. Sorry, I, I didn't understand. He thinks that Singapore, Singapore is crossing the line of democracy and legitimacy and social justice by introducing such a law. Definitely. I think this is one of the most undemocratic laws to ever be introduced in Singapore. Hermes asks, does the law apply to domestic political leaders who do not agree with whatever party or person is in power? Definitely, yes. Mm -hmm. They're automatically designated. And John, this is the final question from John. John, this law is one way in which freedom of expression is cracked down on. It has been used in Russia and has led to the imprisonment of journalists. Have you seen any initial impact so far? So, you know, one of the important things about the law is that it is, it is extra legal. The courts um, can't actually overturn any of these decisions by the government, right? And the government issues direct uh, directives. So there's definitely already been independent media outlets that have said that they're shutting down. Um, because they, they won't be able to survive in this environment. Um, there are activists who are having to relook at, you know, their, their financial support that they get from different people. Um, even collaborating with an embassy, activists in my circles are reconsidering meetings, reconsidering mm -hmm. 
texting yeah. because like texting over something like WhatsApp, which is considered an encrypted platform, can now be seen as covert collaboration with a foreign principal. Kokola, thank you so much for sharing your insight with us here on the stream. Take care. Thank you. For now we go to the Korean Peninsula, where there has been an escalation between the North and South in their show of power. But what will it lead to? It's difficult to see an off-ramp from this inter-Korean arms race unless the two Koreas are able to exercise uh, restraint and to engage in some kind of arms control, which has failed in the past. Now, North Korea spends about 25% of its GDP on the military, where the South spends about 2.5% to about 2.8% of its GDP. So North Korea should engage in arms control or it's going to spend too much on arms at a great sacrifice to the North Korean people. However, engaging in restraint and arms control would contradict the state's uh, ideology and its view of uh, arms and military power as the source of its legitimacy and survival. Last week, North Korea fired at least one underwater ballistic missile, the latest in a series of recent missile tests. The submarine launch came just hours after the US reaffirmed an offer to resume talks with North Korea. Pyongyang has rejected offers from the South and the US, accusing both countries of talking diplomacy while engaging in their own provocative military acts. Sue Kim is a policy analyst at the RAND Corporation and a former CIA analyst. Sue, it's really good to, to see you. Uh, thanks for being here on the stream. This idea of what yeah. is making news on the Korean Peninsula and what makes news internationally about the very same act. Uh, give us some insight into that. Uh, ballistic missile launch test. Um, how, how, is, how, how is that covered in South Korea? So there was a recent, uh, I believe it was a VOA report, uh, where um, the reporter interviewed um, a handful of South Korean citizens to get their take on how, how they viewed the threat. Um, I believe the majority of the respondents said that they don't see it as a threat. Um, it's, it's basically business as usual. Um, the reporter called it basically alarm fatigue. So the South Korean population, they Ironically, of course, um, they, they share border with, with North Korea. Um, so you would think that the country that is most proximate to the threat, that lives with the threat, is going to feel the threat much more palpably than, say, the United States or even Japan. I think this is a question about, if we're talking about how they're viewing the threat, I think it's a question about conditioning. So are they conditioned through to the threat uh, because they actually think that the country is ready um, militarily, politically, et cetera, et cetera, to deal with a North Korean provocation. Or are they conditioned in the way that we're, you know, they just feel like the threat is something that they just don't take seriously anymore because it's just mm -hmm. so repetitive. If it's the latter, I think it's, it's problematic because as um, Dr. Pinkston mentioned in his, in his chat, um, the, the GDP to military spending between North Korea and South Korea is, is quite different. Um, North Korea prioritizes military development, nuclear development, whereas South Korea, by virtue of become, you know, being a democracy, um, much more advanced and integrated into the international community, um, it, you're, you're basically able to diversify your priorities. And I think this is where um, there's questions about, you know, educating the public better about the threat, um, whether or not they actually are being basically fed the type of information that they need in order to, to properly understand the context and also the intentions of the North Korean regime. International relations with the Korean Peninsula is more than just U.S.-Korean Peninsula relations, but certainly the last U.S. administration um, made quite a big deal out about the, their relationship with both North Korea and South Korea. I want to fast forward to current U.S.-Korean Peninsula relations. This is Linda Thomas-Greenfield. She's the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. This is what she just said uh, just last week. Have a listen. Our position remains clear. The DPRK must abide by the Security Council resolutions, and it is time to engage in sustained and substantive dialogue toward the goal of complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. 
we have offered to meet the DPRK officials without any preconditions, and we have made clear that we hold no hostile intent toward the DPRK. Unpack that for us, Sue. Sure. So this is not, you know, from, I think, the grander scheme of U.S.-North Korea relations and, and seeing North Korean behavior. Uh, what the ambassador to the U.N. is actually asking for is, is not anything new. It's not anything more aggressive. I think it's, it's just the United States plainly asking, one, uh, North Korea to, to really just stop its reckless acts um, to consider dialogue and, and to really think about, um, and I guess I think I'll be going off tangent on this, but mm. I think the, the, the bottom line, um, the, the question or the biggest concern, um, of course, is the weapons, but I think more concerning is going to be the intentions of Kim Jong-un, the leader. Um, I believe the first speaker mentioned something about one man basically holding the decision and one man basically being the source of all the problems. Um, we could probably apply the same thing to North Korea, where decisions are basically made by one person. Um, the nuclear deterrent is, is, is it exists to protect Kim Jong-un and, and his regime. So I think what the ambassador was asking for, of course, was North Korea, of course, to stop its um, provocations. And then, two for the international community to really think about uh, the threat seriously, of course, but actually take the steps and follow through and also to call out the, the countries that are not complying or, or conforming with the, the, um, the sanctions. She did not, I don't think, name the specific countries, but um, I believe she was going or, or, or talking about um, China and Russia. So, again, this is just calling out North Korea for, for its bad behavior. And I think if you look at the way the United States has had, had been treating North Korea from 2017 to 2020, um, we didn't really punish North Korea for its bad behavior. I think North Korea just was able to, to do what it wanted uh, without any sort of consequences okay. of anything, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we, we have some YouTube questions for you. I, I, we're going to pick your brain. Uh, thank you, John, for, for sharing this one with us. How does the North import materials to assemble weapons despite being sanctioned? Brief answer, Sue. Uh, it's, again, going back to sanctions and North Korea being able to um, participate and get the help from countries like China and Russia and other countries that are not complying with the sanctions. And it's able to import the technology and also um, extract key critical materials from those technologies that are being imported into the country. Andy Warrior is asking you for some prognostication. Let's see if you're up to that. So let me ask this. Is there any way North Korea and South Korea will become one whole Korea like Germany did? Isn't it high time they reunited? Sue. Sure. I think that's the aspiration that um, the people of North Korea and um, South Korea would like to see. Again, the, the decision, I think, it has to do with politics. And um, from North Korea's perspective, it, everything basically rests on Kim Jong-un's decision. So um, I think that is um, aspirational, not in that it's, it's pejorative, but it's aspirational that it's something that we want to see, but it just takes steps to get there. What do you know that's going on behind the scenes that may well mean that North Korea and South Korea are talking and negotiating, they have a relationship. What would you share with us? You know, the, the I guess the irony or the realities of, of politics in any country is that you don't really hear about what's actually happening now until there's like a change in administration. Sure. Yeah. Um, based, right. So based on what we know about the North-South interaction, um, up to this point, it's been very much one-sided, where South Korea has been wanting to talk to North Korea for, for a while. Um, and as, as far as we can tell in the public sphere, we haven't really seen any um, reciprocating steps from North Korea. So I think we would assume that there's nothing going on behind the scenes. Um, but again, North Korea knows that um, South Korea wants to talk. Um, it wants to, especially under the Moon administration, um, wants to make progress um, within the next few months, um, the remaining months in his office. So, uh, again, this is, you know, it, we probably won't see um, what's going to be happening between the two countries until Thank there's a changeover. But, yes. Appreciate you. And that is our program for today. Have, uh, do you have a story that you want to see us feature? Pitch us at AJ Stream, and your idea may well be on the stream. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.